Hey friends, I'm Michael Kingswood. It's story time on a Saturday. Which means it's Story Saturday, and we're here to continue with reading Fun's Fiction for you. Now, it's been a couple weeks since I uh, did one of these. It's weird. It's been one of those months of August <laughs> where it's like, man, you, you know, you're getting everything done, or you put most things, but it's like you're all discombobulated and weird and so I've been hitting writing deadlines been you know doing getting hitting cash flow deadlines for for uh you know cash flow work <laughs> it's feel like everything's slipping past at the same time uh and one of the things that's bad been slipping past has been story Saturday I apologize for that but we're here back into it again to continue on we have got uh two more episodes of the story we have been doing to finish that up then we'll move on to another story which will be great in the meantime though uh while i've been in discombobulated mode the kickstarter campaign for volume three of 52 stories in 2023 the first two volumes being right here are uh, is under underway and we met the initial goal uh and now we're hoping to achieve a stretch goal before it ends this next tuesday uh tuesday the 22nd of august i believe it is yeah 22nd and it'll be yeah 22nd of august at noon pacific it'll end uh we are currently in you know in the possibility of getting to the first stretch goal which would be nice uh because we hit the stretch goals in the previous two and want to continue hitting stretch goals and more stretch goals going forward but uh maybe not with this kid game but volume four and volume five down the road definitely want to crush i expect volume five will probably crush the hardest i hope it will because it'll be a complete set the project will be fully done that'd be great anyway uh you got a couple more days to go check out the campaign at michaelkingswood.com slash 52 in 23 v3 and give it a back that'd be awesome in the meantime we are here uh continuing on with the novella i wrote a few years ago called the necromancer's lair uh inspired by playing skyrim and like yeah, let's write a story like the dungeon delve uh it's kind of fun and uh this is the third part and next week we'll continue we'll conclude and move on to some other stories that i haven't read here before that you will continue to love uh, a few yeah there's several <laughs> that i've been meaning to uh record for y'all and that'll be good and then uh after we do a few more of those we'll proceed back to the uh the longer books but for now several uh short and novella like stuff to get to you anyway that's new here over there we are now continuing on with the necromancer i wrote it i'm reading it it's awesome sit back enjoy i'll talk to you on the other side hatherly tied off the final stitch in gareth's calf with a particularly rough jerk it hurt not as much as what hatherly did with his shoulder but it hurt Gareth grimaced and had to suppress a snide comment. It would not do to upset Hatherley now, after he had gone to all the trouble of playing doctor. Besides, the manservant had emerged from the battle with the animated corpses quite a lot better off than Gareth had. That was worth quite a bit. Thanks, Hatherley, Gareth said after he regained his breath. Of course, my lord, Hatherley replied. He took a moment to coil the remaining thread, then... He tucked it and the needle he was using into a case, which he replaced inside his pack. Then he stood and offered Gareth a hand. It took some doing, since he outweighed Hatherley by a fair amount, even without the heavy steel of his breastplate, bracers, and greaves, but after a bit of huffing and puffing, Gareth got to his feet. The pain in his right calf immediately flared, growing worse from the weight suddenly placed on it. Son of a whore, Gareth muttered, earning a quirked eyebrow from Hatherley. It'll be some weeks before you regain the full use of the leg, my lord, he said in a clinical tone that Gareth had come to recognize well. For that matter, your shoulder will be some time in recovery as well. Just because I was able to force it back into its joint does not mean got it, Hatherly. Anything else? The serving man shook his head, and Gareth felt a small surge of relief. He was right, of course. Hatherly was always right. That was why he did such a great business as a scholar for hire. Hatherley preferred the term sage, but what was the difference before the incident with the bandits that led him to swearing fealty to Gareth? It would have been nice if he were wrong this time, though. 
Since Hatherley had worked his magic, Gareth's shoulders felt almost good again. Sore, but at least he could move it. He would not want to test that under combat conditions, though. Or his leg, for what that was worth. And here they were, within the necromancer's domain. Small chance he would just let them go so they could come back when Gareth was fully healed and ready. He nodded, resigned. I just hope the stitches hold. There will be more action ahead. Hatherley's other eyebrow joined his twin, high on his forehead. My lord? He cleared his throat, taking a moment to glance at the shattered cell and the now unmoving corpses littering the room. Perhaps it would be more prudent to go. Gareth had to suppress an amused smile. For once, he had made the leap of logic before his manservant. Wonders never ceased, it seemed. If I thought we had a chance of making it out without conflict, we would be on our way home right now, he said, truthfully. That necromancer will not let us escape, though. And besides, he gestured toward the ceiling they had apparently fallen through, somewhat more believable with a new hole in it, he had to admit. We cannot go the way we came. Do you have any idea where the exit is from here? Hatherley shook his head and his lips lowered into a frown. Was that uncertainty Gareth saw in his eyes? Don't worry, Hatherley, we'll be fine, you'll see. Gareth heard the undertones in his voice as he spoke, and he was surprised to not hear the mountain of uncertainty he felt come through. Maybe he was getting better at this being a leader bit. Hatherley was not the first who seemed to expect it of him, though he was the first to flat out swear himself to Gareth's service. Crazy fellow. Hatherley just looked at him in silence. Gareth began to grow somewhat uncomfortable under his gaze. Finally, Hatherley grunted and said, Very well, my lord. He stepped back toward the cell and bent over. When he returned, he held a length of metal out toward Gareth, the upper half from one of the broken bars. Makeshift, but this should work as a crutch. Gareth blinked. A crutch? What did he... He moved slightly, settling more of his weight onto his injured leg, and almost collapsed from the immediate protest his wounds made. Indeed, a crutch was just the thing. He made a shallow nod of thanks, then took the length of metal. It was bent, and where it had been sheared off under the force of the animated corpse's pry bar, jagged. But it was just about the right length, so he placed the jagged end on the ground, the more gently rounded end under his arm, and tried to take a step. It hurt. But it worked. He was at least slightly mobile again. That was the best he could hope for. There was not much to the level of the tower, assuming they were within the necromancer's tower and not somewhere else, that held the room with their cell. The doorway opened into a featureless hallway that encircled the room completely, and it did not appear to have any other exits. It was well lit, but there was no obvious source of the light. The light was just there. It was more than a bit unsettling. They made two complete circuits of the hallway before Gareth finally stopped. This was getting nowhere, and besides, his leg hurt like hell. He needed a rest. Now what? It defies probability that there's no way to get to and from this level, Hatherley said, his voice contemplative. Gareth snorted. He's a bloody spellcaster. For all we know, he could just, you know, he waved his left hand up in the air, poof himself to and fro. Hatherley shook his head. I've heard of that sort of spell is very difficult and requires great skill, but more importantly, it is very expensive. Gareth looked askance at him. Come again? The components required for a spell like that are very rare. Or so the writings say. You would know, O oh sage of sages. Gareth sighed and straightened his back. It felt good to slouch to put more weight on the makeshift crutch. Alas, there was work to be done still if he wanted to see his own bed again. Heatherly inclined his head in response to Gareth's words, a flash of a smile appearing on his face for a moment. He had apparently decided to take the remark as a compliment. Good thing, too, because Gareth had not meant it as an insult. A friendly jibe, a bit of teasing maybe, but certainly not an insult. All right, let's make another pass. He forced the little voice, now grown quite a bit larger after his first two laps, in his head that begged him to quit and sit down into the back of his head. This was no time for ninnies. Check the floor and the walls carefully as we go. As we go more slowly, he meant. There was no need for him to even consider voicing the thought, though. Hatherley lagged considerably during the lap, forcing Gareth to slow his pace to avoid leaving him behind. The man was an absolute saint, sometimes. 
They had almost completed a third circuit before Hatherley found it. It should have been Gareth. It was on his side of the corridor. But the ever-increasing protests from his injured calf had begun intruding ever more steadily into his consciousness until it was all he could do to put one foot in front of the other without breaking down. Nanta blazes with a makeshift crutch. It had helped at first. Hell, it still helped. But the blunt end was beginning to dig into his armpit something fierce, becoming almost as much a source of discomfort as assistance. All that was lost when Heatherly spoke up, though. Well, most of it. Gareth bit back a curse as he turned to look at the spot in the wall where Hatherley was pointing, and had to admit the revelation hardly suppressed any of his discomfort at all, but at least it provided a distraction. At first, he could not see it. Hatherley was crouched next to the wall, pointing eagerly at a place just an inch above the floor, but there was nothing to Gareth's eyes. He was just about to tell Hatherley to stop being a bloody fool when he recalled the carvings in the alcove. He moved backwards, away from Hatherley and whatever he was looking at. Still nothing. Gareth moved again and struck the opposite wall. Nothing. That just left one more thing. He gritted his teeth in anticipation of pain to come and bent his legs, lowering himself into as deep a crouch as he could manage without either passing out from pain or falling over. And then he saw it. It was the same symbol as was on the ceiling of the alcove in the cave, carved into the stone as though by a fine chisel. But it had not come into view until he had lowered his line of sight, which meant it was not a simple carving at all, but some sort of magical sigil, just like in the alcove. Gareth grinned. Well done, Heatherly, he said. He straightened his legs and very neatly fell down. If he had not had the piece of metal there, was no way he would not have. All the same, he had to take a deep breath and force the protest from his injured leg away before he could speak again. What now? Hatherley's triumphant smile faded slightly, and he shrugged. I doubt it functions the same as the sigil in the cave, my lord. Could be this is just a lure to draw us in. A lure leading nowhere? Hatherley inclined his head, conceding the point. In which case, it likely marks the location of something important. Thanks for stating the obvious, Gareth did not say. Well, play with it. See if you can get it to do something. Hatherley nodded and turned to the sigil. He began probing it with his fingers, and Gareth winced. That was probably not a good idea. He really should be the one to do this stupid leg. Gareth watched his manservant working on the sigil, impatience born from frustration and embarrassment at his own ineffectiveness growing all the while. Finally, he could not contain it anymore. Anything? A slight shrug accompanied Hatherley's response. There appears to be a small protrusion here, near the wolf's snout. Maybe if I press it, Hatherley's hand moved and there was a loud click that echoed down the hallway. This was either going to be very good or very bad. Gareth would not give odds either way. Gareth found himself counting the seconds in his head as nothing else happened. At ten, though, he began to hear a low rumbling from beneath the floor. It grew louder over the next several seconds and the floor began to shake slightly. Then at thirty, the paving stones in the floor before he and Hatherley began to rise up. At the same time, the stone ceiling began to pull back, creating an opening above. Finally, the stone's movement stopped, and there was a stone staircase leading upward, where before there was only circling hallway. The two men stepped back. Hatherley looked stunned. Gareth had no doubt he looked similarly. Well, Hatherley cleared his throat. That did the trick. Indeed, my lord. I guess this confirms that we are in the necromancer's tower. Seems we have to go up to get down. Gareth looked up the stairs, then down at his injured leg. This was not going to be easy. But there was no point in dilly-dallying. He took a deep breath and hauled himself up the first step. Let's go. The stairs climbed for what seemed forever, circling in the same manner as the hallway below. After ten steps, Gareth's injured leg was screaming in protest, and he had to sit down to rest before continuing. Hatherley kept the watch, his long sword at the ready, as Gareth worked out the kinks as best he could. But it took far too long to get moving again. The necromancer had to know of their movements, this was his tower after all, and he was doubtless preparing the next surprise for them. Gareth half expected to hear footsteps descending toward them at any moment. But that did not happen, and after a few minutes he felt ready to continue upwards. Ten more stairs and Gareth was sorely tempted to sit again 
but instead he gritted his teeth and pushed on. No need to give the necromancer any more time than necessary. Finally, the staircase ended at a small landing that backed up to a stout wooden door that was reinforced with strips of iron. It was ordained only with an iron ring where a doorknob would be and a dark iron square in the center of the door about at eye level, which was engraved with the necromancer's wolf and deer sigil. Gareth paused on the landing and looked at the door. Nothing seemed unusual about it, but he had a feeling there was more there than met the eye. Not that anything so far had met with expectations, so why should this door... I wonder what sort of trap the necromancer may have placed here, Hatherley said, echoing Gareth's thoughts. Not sure. Why don't you try it and we'll see? Gareth glanced aside at Hatherley, a teasing smile forming on his lips, in time to see the serving man flinch, then square his shoulders and take a deep breath. He stepped forward toward the door. No, Gareth said forcefully. Goodness, man, I was joking. Hatherley blinked, then frowned back at Gareth, his expression one of reproach. Gareth rolled his eyes. One of these days, he was going to figure out the fellow's sense of humor. Some day. Hit it with a piece of wood or something first. Do you have any more torches? Hatherley nodded and pulled his pack off. He rummaged through it for a moment, then put it back on, unlit torch in hand. Brace yourself, my lord, he said, then he reached out and tapped the door with the torch. Nothing happened. The two men exchanged glances, Hatherley's questioning. Gareth shrugged and waved him onward. Hatherley tapped the door again, this time on the iron strips. Again, nothing. The same with the iron ring and the square. He shrugged again and set the torch down, then reached out and took hold of the ring with his bare hand. Hatherley stiffened and let out a low groan. His body began shaking. Hatherley! Gareth surged forward, ignoring the stab of pain from his leg, and pulled the man's servant back. His grip loosened from the door easily, and very quickly he was back out of danger. Are you all right? Concerned, Gareth looked him over, only to find him wearing an impish grin. Pardon, my lord, Hatherley said. Just joking. Dumbfounded, Gareth stared at him in shock for a long moment. Sudden anger conflicted with relief and finally gave way to wry amusement, and he found himself laughing, his earlier thought about Hatherley's sense of humor returning to mind ironically. Bloody hell, man, don't do that again. He could not force his tone to sternness, however much he wanted to. Hatherley's smile slipped a bit, and he nodded. At any rate, he said, after clearing his throat softly, The ring does not appear to have any function, my lord. It did not rotate, and it would not budge when I pulled on it. Gareth frowned and looked at the door. His eyes alighted on the iron square in the necromancer's sigil. That must be the key, he murmured, and stepped forward to examine it more closely. The sigil was the same as it had been the last two times, the square of iron plain, unadorned. The sigil was engraved in the iron, but not deeply. Gareth ran his hand over the square and could barely feel the lines of the engraving. He could not see or feel any part of it that stood out in any way. Yet it must be there. The previous sigils had pointed the way, this one must as well. Unless this was all a sick joke of some kind, designed to keep them running around pointlessly, until the necromancer was ready to take them both out, or until they died of thirst or hunger. That thought made Gareth's stomach growl. They'd eaten through what small morsels they had brought with them in their stay in the cage, and the water flasks were running low as well. The necromancer, if he had been keeping tabs on them, and Gareth was certain that was the case, had to know or suspect their state of affairs. Why go to the trouble of killing them when he could just let nature take care of it for him? That was a depressing thought. Is it just me, my lord, Hatherley said from behind Gareth's shoulder, or are the wolf's and the deer's eyes a bit larger on this sigil? Gareth did a double take and peered at the sigil more closely. I'm not sure. I suppose maybe. What if I... He reached out and touched his fingertips into the eyes of both beasts. There was another resonating click, this time from within the door itself. Gareth retreated, as much a retreat as he could manage with his leg anyway. After several seconds, nothing more happened, and he let out the breath he was holding. If they were lucky, the click was the door's locking mechanism acting in response to his touching the sigil that way. He did not want to think about it what it would be if they were unlucky. Gareth took a few moments to shift his axe into his left hand. It would be of no use trying to wield it in his right, not with the crutch he needed to use. 
Then he had Hatherly strap the shield onto his upper right arm. It was an awkward fit, but at least it would offer some small amount of protection. Hatherly prepared himself, drawing steel and getting a good grip on his sword. Then, at a nod from Gareth, he grabbed the ring on the door and pulled. Okay, so not a huge amount of action in this one, but uh, clearly we are in kind of dire straits with our dynamic duo here. Um, Gareth's not in much condition to fight, and Hathaly can fight, but I mean, it's like uh, <laughs> going to be rough. Uh, we'll see what's past this door. Next week, we'll see on Story Saturday. And I mean that this time. We're actually really next week. Uh, on Story Saturday, we will conclude this fun novella and you can see if they merge victorious or if they become zombies either way it'll be fun come back here next week and we'll do that make sure that you have liked this video just subscribe to this channel or and if it if video or if you're listening to the podcast subscribe to the podcast and make sure that you show support how do you show support besides liking and subscribing you ask by buying books you can go get all the books I've got at michaelkingswood.com slash store, which is the absolute 100% without doubt certain best place to go get all my stuff. Why is it the best place? Because it belongs to my company. And thus, you bypass the middleman and get me maximum profit. And you get a direct one-to-one -one relationship with the artist type I don't really think of myself as an artist, although I guess I kind of am, uh, that you that you like and want to support. And it's awesome that way. Now, of course, you can go to all the other retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, uh, iBooks, Google Play, half a million other places where my stuff is. And I won't fault you for that. I'll just make less money. But uh, if you want to do that, you can do that as well. MikeKingswood.com slash books to read, the number two. Uh, we'll get you to a universal book link page where it's a whole nice spread of all of, of not all of my books. I don't think are up there yet, but uh, the majority of them. And you can pick which retailer you want to go to through the links and then you're good. Hey, cool. That's great. Um, so you can do that as well. The other really important thing to do to support is back the Kickstarter for 52 stories in 2023 volume three, as we talked about before. Volume 1 came out. Volume 2 came out. Now we're doing Volume 3. And it ends this Tuesday at noon Pacific. So if you've been waiting to show some love, waiting time's over. Get over there. Back the campaign. Tell all your friends. And it'll be awesome. Uh, we've, we're already funded. We're approaching the uh, first, first uh, stretch goal. <laughs> a little ways away from it still, to be honest with you. But we'd like to hit it because stretch goals are good. So come on out. Check it out. And I think that's all. The other, only other thing you can do to show support is show up next week, where we will conclude uh, this Necromancer's Layer story. Until then, don't do anything I wouldn't do. 